At this time, I'd like to call upon Sister Afia Siddiqui. Uh, Sister Afia is going to be a sophomore at MIT, inshallah. Uh, she's, mad, uh, she's doing her, her, her uh, major is in genetics, and she'll be leaving day after tomorrow. Sister Afia is, involved, is going to be involved in MSA at MIT, and she's already the Dawah coordinator, and she's already started work, alhamdulillah. Please, Sister Afia. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you. It is my challenge, not only to every single person on the face of this planet Earth, but also if there's any civilization on any other planet, it's my challenge to them as well. That Islam is the best savior and protector for women. And I am saying this with all this confidence, not out of arrogance, but because I believe that Islam was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most just and merciful God, the God biased neither in favor of men or women, the creator and sustainer of both men and women. Islam elevates women to a level that has no parallel. Let's just take one example. Our Western philosophers and saints, they say that woman is the seat of the devil, but the Quran calls her Muhsana, fortress against the devil. They say that she is the one responsible for our downfall from paradise. But the Prophet Muhammad said, Paradise? Paradise is under the feet of a woman, a mother. And that's not all. She has been given rights and protection in every sphere of life. She has all the basic human rights, including the right of inheritance, of owning property, of choosing her husband, of getting dowry, of divorce, of not only earning money, but even keeping every single cent she earns. And what not. You name it, and it's there. <coughs> but let me make it clear that this earning money thing, in Islam, it is not the responsibility of a woman. Her responsibility, her duty, is with Allah and with her family. And if she takes care of that, alhamdulillah, she's in good shape, according to the Prophet Muhammad. That's enough for her salvation. But this does not mean that her duty is to slave away at home like a bondsmaid. This was at least not the practice or the teaching of our Prophet Muhammad or his companions. Once, a man came to the Caliph Umar bin Khattab. He wanted to complain about his wife. He was standing outside uh, the Caliph's house, and from inside, he could hear Caliph Umar's wife giving him a hard time. But Umar's voice was nowhere to be heard. He thought, well, looks like the poor Caliph is in the same torment I am. He started going back. Omar saw him and called him back, heard his story, and you know what he replied? He said, do you not see that my wife cooks my food, washes my clothes, suckles my children, thus relieving me of the necessity of employing a cook, a washerman, and a nurse, <coughs> even though she is not in the slightest degree responsible for this. And more than that, I have peace of mind on account of her and I'm protected from adultery. In view of all this, I put up with her excesses, and I would advise you to do the same. And the Prophet uh, Muhammad said, the more civil and kind a person is to his wife, the more perfect in his faith he is. The Quran says, وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ فَإِن كَرِهْتُمُوهُنَّ فَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُوا شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Live with your wives, treat them with kindness and equity. If you take a dislike to them, it may be that you dislike something, but Allah has kept a great deal of good in it. The Quran further says, وَلَا تُمْسِكُوهُنَّ طِرَارًا لِتَعْتَدُوا وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكْ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهُ وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا آيَاتِ اللَّهِ هُسُوًا Do not keep your wives by force, so that you may injure them or hurt them. And whoever does this wrongs his own soul. Do not treat the words of Allah as a joke. My dear brothers, Allah means business here. And my sisters, this does not mean that we take advantage of all these examples and start taking advantage of men. No. What I am saying is simply that a woman is not an unpaid slave. According to the Prophet Muhammad, she is the queen of her house. And not only that, 
she is also given permission to go out, and not only that, she is given respect, protection, and dignity, things which no other society, especially what the West has not given her. The hijab is not a restriction. It allows a woman to be judged by her content, not by her packaging, by what's written on the pages, not the pretty artwork on the cover. We are judged by who we are, by what we have to say, not by how we happen to look while we are saying it. Islam does not see the woman as a prized cow to be paraded before the world. No. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam summed it up beautifully. He said, the best object of benefit of the entire world is the pious woman. This is so profound. Not the rich woman, not the beautiful or successful woman because these qualities will not benefit her in the long run. Minds can be lost, wealth can be spent, and beauty shall change. These ephemeral qualities are for the pleasure of this world, whereas piety is for the pleasure of Allah. His advice to men seeking a wife was, get one who is religious, not the one in the 50% tax bracket, the one with the Jaguar, the one with her own corporation, the one with the great looks, or the one who brings more dowry. No. In Islam, a woman is seen first and foremost as a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not as the slave of a human being. And in the eyes of Allah, she is no less than a man. It is true. Laysa dhakaruka al-unsa. The man is different from the woman. Psychologically, biologically, physiologically different. The man is physically more stronger. We, we can see that. doesn't need any explanation. So Allah has given him the charge, the responsibility for providing for the, fam for the family, for earning for the family. He's been given the daraja, the position of leadership in the family. But this does not make a woman inferior. No. Where rights are concerned, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَ her rights are equal, mythal, to those of man, even though man has been given the daraja, the degree over her. The degree, the responsibility, and accountability for providing and sustaining the family. What has this got to do with inferiority or superiority? Nothing. Allah has made it very clear. Inni la udi'u amala amilim minkum min dhakarin aw unsa ba'dukum min ba'd. I shall not waste the efforts of any of you, man or woman. You are members one of another. And, inna akramakum and Allahi atqakum. The person who is more revered, who is more superior, or who is more respected in the eyes of Allah, is the one who is more pious, who has more taqwa, regardless of whether it's a man or a woman. History is filled with women who exemplified this fact, who taught men as well as women, who gave religious verdicts, who fought and died, all for the sake of Allah, not to prove to the world that they were capable. My dear Muslim sisters, we, unlike the non-Muslim women, we do not have to prove anything to this world. All we have to prove is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are capable. Yes, we are capable of becoming true and ideal Muslim women. Women like the Sahabiyat, not 5 feet 10 inches or something like that. No. Women like the Sahabiyat, out of hundreds of examples, and I could go on forever, but I'm sure you all must be hungry. I'll just quote one example. Asma bint Yazid. She embraced Islam when she was a teenager at the time of Hijra, and she was only in her 20s, the Battle of Yarmouk. She killed nine soldiers, with what? With the pole of a tent, let alone women. I don't know how many men can even do that, today or whenever, I don't know. And not only that, she was also a great scholar. She opened a school, and from her school, many of our respected ulama of the Taba'un period, they graduated from her school. Aisha, Khadija, Fatima, Zainab, Asma, Umm Ammara, Umm Salma, Umm Kulsum, Umm Hakim, there are so many names. Who are all these? These were the scholars, the teachers, the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the warriors 
and the mothers, daughters, sisters, and wives of the times of the Prophet Muhammad. These were the people about whom Allah has said, Radiyallahu anhum wa radu'an, Ula'ika hizbullah, ala inna hizballahi humul muflihun. Allah is pleased with them and they with Allah. This is the group of Allah. And indeed, it is the group of Allah that will succeed. And we did succeed in this world and in the hereafter. Thirty years after the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslim Empire spread all the way from Africa to India and Spain, three continents. Why is it, I will ask you, that today we are the third world? We have lost the respect and dignity we enjoyed. We are apologetic and submissive. And to whom? To the disbelievers, the kuffar. Astaghfirullah. Why is it that today sons of the caliber of Muhammad bin Qasim, Tariq bin Ziyad, and Khalid bin Walid are not born? Because we don't have mothers of the caliber of Fatima, Zainab, Khala, and Asma. And why don't we have those mothers? Let us think about this. Brothers and sisters, there are 357 in Surah Nisa, right where the commandments for women are laid. And another verse in Surah Tahrim. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from hellfire. Brothers and sisters, this is one extreme. Inna allaha la yuhibbu al-mu'tadeen. Allah does not like any transgression, any extreme. <coughs> the other extreme is equally bad. There are people who are guilty of burying their women alive. Yes, today, mentally burying them by telling them that they are inferior, third-class slaves of men. And may Allah forgive us in the name of Sunnah. May I ask whose Sunnah are they following? This is not the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. What is his sunnah? He, if his shoe would break, he would mend it himself. And then he would run a race with his wife Aisha and let her win the race so that she could also enjoy herself. These extremes, brothers and sisters, have driven more people away from Islam than we would even like to believe. Not only women, men as well. Not only non-Muslims, Muslims as well. A man once came to Ismail al-Faruqi and said, that Islam seems to be such a biased religion. Whenever I go to the mosque, to a religious institution to learn about Islam, I see so many men. But where are the women? Good question. And I repeat, where are the women? It is so easy today for anyone and everyone to come up to a woman and say, hey, this is Islam. And what will the poor woman say? now Sadakna, I believe, because she doesn't know any better. Her basic right, I should say, her duty of education, religious and secular, has been taken away from her. What is the result? Brothers and sisters? <laughs> okay, brothers and sisters, this right of education by taking it away from women, what do we see? If a woman has messed up ideas, non-Muslim ideas, or if she is totally ignorant of what's going on around her. In either case, can she be expected to raise a child the model of a perfect Muslim? Of course not. The first five years of the child are not as trivial as we think they are. According to a fact, scientific fact, the brain of the child develops not only before he is born, but it takes the first five years for the brain to fully develop. And in these years, whatever he sees around him, whatever he sees his mother, his parents doing, will have an impact on his future character. If the mother is the model of an Islamic woman, and the father for that matter too, the child will more likely than not become an Islamic model himself. But if the mother herself is locked up in a dark corner of a dark room of a dark home, secluded from the entire world, what can you expect? What is this generation gap that we see? And why are all these un-Islamic, cultural, traditional practices so prevalent in our Muslim world? 
There's many of them. Let me just take one, Jahez, dowry, as you saw in the sketch earlier on. It is a big thing in India and Pakistan. And what is this? Well, this is that at the time of marriage, the girl has to bring cash, furniture, God knows what not. This is totally un-Islamic. Then why is it that so many good girls cannot get married because of this? And if they are getting married, a lot of times their parents don't even ask them if they want to get married or not. The Quran is very clear on this. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, la yahillu lakum antarithun nisa'a karha. Oh, you who believe, it is not lawful for you to take a woman by force against her will. No. And if they do get married, may God forbid it, but if to a cruel, unkind person. They bear his excesses their whole life. Number one, because they don't even know that according to Islam, if a woman wants at the time of the marriage, in the marriage contract, she can put the stipulation and keep the right of divorce in her hands. And if I am wrong, Brother Jamal Badawi, please correct me. I request you right now. Okay, okay he's saying I'm right. Okay. So this is, oh, there's more even. Okay. I don't have time. That's the problem. Anyway, so this is one thing. The other thing, in some very traditional families, if a girl even wants to ask what is in her marriage contract or what the contract is, period, they label her as shameless. And if such a naive girl does get divorced, why does the whole society look down upon her? Islam does not. Allah does not. In the Quran, in fact, where Allah is reproaching the wives of the Prophet Muhammad for giving him a hard time, he says, that if you do not repent, I will replace you with women better than you, who will be married previously and who will be virgins. Brothers and sisters, when I was in Pakistan, I had worked very, very closely with the president of United Islamic Organization for two years. And in fact, she'll be coming to America later on this year, ask her and she'll tell you, day in and day out, how many cases of women there are suffering, having serious problems because of these and many other un-Islamic practices. And when I say un-Islamic practices, I am including all these Western forms of dating and whatnot. I'm including all of these. Brothers and sisters, this has got to stop now. This has got to change. We as Muslims, what is our goal? Our goal is to serve Allah. Why are all these un-Islamic practices so prevalent? We have to change them now. أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَأَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Has not the time come for Muslims that their heart turned towards Allah, remembrance of Allah, and what Allah has revealed, which is the truth? Yes, the time has come. The time is now for us to get together and come up with solutions for these problems. Let none of us think that we cannot make a difference. Yes, we can, if our intention is pure. If we strive in the path of Allah, Allah has said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُكُلَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Whoever will strive to reach Allah, Allah will guide him to the way that leads to Allah. And indeed, Allah is with the people who, who are righteous, who do good deeds, who are the Muhsineen. So let us do away with our cultural, traditional, whatever biases. Shun everything un-Islamic and turn towards Islam. Wa ma'alimna Islam.